Depression among young people is on the rise. So why? And is our world equipped to offer any real proper help? You're watching Roundtable. And welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. Pretty grim figures, facts and figures coming up. The World Health Organisation saying that suicide is the leading cause of death for people between the ages of 20 and 34 in the UK, men being particularly at risk. And the link between suicide and depression, well, it's long been established. And sadly, we are seeing a rise in both. Depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. And it's rising among adolescents aged 12 to 17. UK charity Mind describes depression as a low mood that lasts for a long time and affects your everyday life. The National Institute of Mental Health estimates that 3 million adolescents aged 12 to 17 have had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. Teen depression appears to be on the rise equally among urban, rural and suburban populations. Research by University College London found teenage girls are twice as likely to show depressive symptoms linked to social media than their male counterparts. But suicide rates are higher in boys than girls. Boys are four times more likely to die from suicide than girls, according to Stanford Children's Health. What's fueling the rise in youth depression? and our treatments accessible to everyone. And let's take a look at this in, in some detail. From New York, we're joined by Jessica Schleider, Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology, Stony Brook University. She's on Long Island. With me in the studio, we have Georgia Brown, Program Manager for Franklin Scholars, which helps young people deal with the sort of problems we're talking about. Aaron Kapoor, here too. Campaigner for Male Mental Health, who had problems himself at a younger age and the psychologist Julie Shiner. Listen, thank you all very much indeed. This, this has been described as the leading global disability depression. Let, let's come to you first of all, Jessica. Why is it on the rise? It's such a complicated question, and I think we have to consider the role both of the fact that before the 1980s or so, a lot of psychiatrists, psychologists, didn't even think that teenagers experienced depression. Um, so I think in this age group, it's still a relatively new thing to measure and understand. So I think that what we're seeing now is a combination of an increasingly stressful world and an increased level of attention, lowered levels of stigma, and improvements in detection of these problems, and mm. teenagers' increased willingness to report that they're experiencing them. You know, so I think it's... A I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to put it, jump in here, because you say increasingly stressful world, and we'll talk about this. Um, some people are describing young people today as, as snowflakes. They don't have to put up with wars in this country. They don't have to put up with famines. Uh, they, they live longer. Um, they have more access to information. Uh, Jessica, you first of all, and then Julia is the other psychologist here. Um, why did they got it more difficult when, in fact, on the face of it, it all seems a little bit easier? That's a very fair question to be asking. And I think... When it comes to stress that adolescents are facing, it's important to know that, firstly, they didn't experience the world before, so they don't have that as a reference point. Um, but there are new stressors now. There's more income inequality in the world. Um, there's a lot of political challenges across the world as well. Um, and, you know, there are you know, these structural stressors to navigate, as well as increased things like academic pressure in the United States that can also contribute. Um, so I think it's a variety of things that can make growing okay. up a very difficult thing to do. Julia, I, I think that's a really valid point that Jessica makes there. That there is no reference point. You, you are where you are and you can only live by what experiences you yeah. personally yeah. have had. But what are the external pressures? So for a lot of the children that I've seen, um, Lots of them are saying that social media has been a huge problem for them. Uh, things like cyberbullying, because they still have access to their social media after school. So when I was at school, which was a long time ago, you didn't have access to your friends after school. But now 
it's 24 7 with a lot of the kids that i see so would you say it is solely this not solely and, that. and i do know by the way jessica that you disagree mm. with this to some extent and i'll come back to you for that <laughs> in just a moment but but julia is you think that's the main cause if not the only one I think everything that Jessica said is true, and I think yeah. throw in social media as well for that. There is a lot of pressure for parents, for families, and a lot of the kids that I see, a lot of the parents are like, fix my child. And I said, well, this child exists within a system. It's not just this child with a mental health but, problem. But fair to family. say, I mean, this is a question mm. rather than a statement, is it fair to say that with social media, and you, you're both very young, uh, with social media, People don't feel as though they have the family nest as it was and the close um, family and group support that they used to have. Now, suddenly, they are out there just to seed among the fields. Yeah. So what a terrible use of words, but I think you know what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scattered to the wind. I would say that I think um, the importance and appreciation of human interaction has gone down, or at least people's uh, value of it to a certain extent. They think that they can interact with their peers online and kind of losing that interaction face to face. It doesn't develop the kind of skills. It doesn't develop the kind of just kind of the feelings, I suppose, that emotional development that is so important for a healthy, productive child. And so they are, as a result of kind of going online and also not feeling that there's as many opportunities offline for them to interact with one another, it's resulting in these issues kind of flaring up and then not necessarily having the, um, the access or the support network around them, like you're mentioning, for them to feel that they have um, kind of a safety net when that problem does arise. It isn't going to be the same um, solution as the problem that's causing it. If it's social media, you're not going to go to social media necessarily for a kind of comfy blanket or a kind of um, reassurance, because quite yeah, often it's where they're hearing that negativity. OK, Aaron, what I agree. I believe that social media has become a, set, a safe space for um, young kids and even adults as well. So, obviously, with um, I, as you say, within human interaction, the communication has just broken down over the years, I believe, anyway. And it's also a safe place for trolls. I think that's one thing. Yeah. It might be a safe space that's for ironic, some... That's ironic, isn't it? Exactly. A safe place for people who are making places unsafe. Mm, exactly. OK, t tell me a little bit about your personal situation. You're 28, 29 I'm now. 29 now. 29 now. This was in your early 20s that you suffered from depression. Didn't even know it. I had no, no awareness of it. So um, I, after my secondary school, so high school, at the age of 16, it sort of hit me right in front of me. And I, and I knew that, right, maybe something was wrong, but I took no sort of attention to it because at a young age, you, you don't take awareness of these things because, you know, you have other sort of pressures. You're trying to fit in with the other kids, mm -hmm. trying to get on with your studies and just trying to find out, identify yourself. So, and you're trying to make it look like you don't stand out, so you sort of mm. bury these thoughts, do you? Yeah, so I sort of buried them inside, um, didn't talk about them, didn't make um, daylight of them, sort of kind of plodded along, if you will, carried on. And by the time I finished my studies and had graduated from the university, I was about the age of 21, 22, it all came to a massive standstill and I had a massive breakdown. And at that point, I realised that maybe I should have done something about it. And so I kind of spent the next few years sort of learning about myself, studying myself, studying what was actually wrong and what I needed to do. Did you have suicidal thoughts? And I'll be honest, I did have suicidal thoughts um, once I'd broken down, cos I just sort of saw myself as a disgrace. I saw myself as that I let myself down and that um, I didn't deserve to be here and I should have done something about it and that maybe I, I didn't belong. We'll talk about the differences in the way this affects uh, male and female in just a moment. Mm. But, Georgia, the sort of story that you hear from Aaron here, um, he said it started when he was maybe 16 mm. or something like that. Is this the sort of story you hear from many of your students through Franklin Scholars? Mm. And uh, I'm assuming the answer is probably yes. Yeah. Um, how do you help them get through it? What's the, the new approach today compared to... I'd like to s day. well, I'd like to say it's a new approach, kind of as a blanket term. I don't think it necessarily is, yeah. but we're all about relationships, um, developmental relationships, which are kind of typified for having certain characteristics that you would see in a friendship. Obviously, care and rapport are really important, but also a fundamental quality of having some challenge and progress and high expectations of each other to uh, improve in certain areas and being supportive along that journey together. And so, making sure that young people that do come onto our programme who have similar experiences, sometimes we would say we're more of a kind of an intervention that is there for preventative measures, making sure that there's a, that uh, system in place so that young people hopefully don't get to the point that you unfortunately reached. But in a school environment, kids are spending seven and a half thousand hours in their lifetime going to school. It should be a place that they feel that there's somebody on hand to support them if they've had these troubling kind of yeah. thoughts. How do you know, feelings. this is for anybody here, um, how do you know that depression isn't just a temporary thing, that you're feeling a bit lost, um, and that it has become an illness. 
Should we, should we go to New York for that one first? Sure. So this is probably the most common question I get from parents and teachers who are concerned about a kid in their classroom or their son or daughter. Um, and it's really a matter of severity and how long it's been going on and how much it's getting in the way of things that, you know, kids would normally do on a day to day basis. So school, <clears throat> maintaining friendships, being part of the family. Um, but generally, when things are really getting in the way of doing the things that are typical for a teenager to be doing, and when it lasts for at least two weeks, typically quite a bit longer than that, um, we would say, you know, that kid probably meets criteria for a depressive episode. Yeah, truly. Yeah. It's the same thing here as well that usually, and again, I always say to the parents, look out for all of these things with your children. Are they engaging in the same They're not things? just being a stroppy, They're not just being stroppy down. teenagers. Yeah. You, parents can also see that there's a qualitative change in their child. You can see that there's a, 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 a lowering of mood. They're hiding themselves away a lot more. And yes, it is very difficult to see sometimes with what parents will call stroppy teenagers. But I always say, look out for all of these things because they're very well hidden. They can be very well hidden. Teenagers are brilliant at hiding things. Absolutely brilliant. Which brings us back to you, Aaron. Did anybody else around you have any idea? Perhaps, I mean, you say you didn't even really know it yourself, but did anybody else come to you and say, listen, what, what, what's going on? What's the problem? In back in what you said, teenagers are very good at hiding mm. what they feel because mm. even uh, at a very, a very supportive modern family, who are very open-minded to however I felt. They'd always said to me, you can come to us, even from a young age, mm. but I always hid it from them, but they never picked up on it. And I think that's, it can be quite dangerous. So like mm. you said, Julie, you, you know, for the younger generation, we do need to do what we can mm. in our responsibilities to pick up on it and to support them. They might come across as stroppy, angry, upset, mm. or over-emotional or hypersensitive, but it's our duty to kind of, kind of guide them along the way. Is there... A direct correlation, this is more for the professionals here, if you like, and please, Georgia, you come into this as well because that's what the work you do. Um, is there a direct correlation between the rise in suicides, particularly male suicides, mm. and the rise in depression, or are they not necessarily linked? Judy, you first. I think it's hard to say one way or the other definitively, but definitely, like you said, there has definitely been a rise in male suicides because um, men are not very good at asking for help. They're much worse, sorry, Aaron, but um, men are generally... We see men are much worse at asking for help. Generally, they're getting a bit better now. We're, there's so many more campaigns about male depression, yeah. male suicide, and bringing men... And sort of taking the stigma out of therapy, looking into, so, uh, into mental health services, actually seeking out that support. Um, I don't think the two exist solely as two separate things, like suicide and depression. I think the two are very closely linked. And we'll, we'll go into it in a little while, if we may, about the differences between how these things affect uh, male or, or mm. men or women or boys and girls. But I wanted to throw this one at you two here. Um, have you heard of Dr Tim Cantifer? Uh, he's written a book, he's a psychologist as well, called The Curse of the Strong, and he says that when under stress, weak or lazy people give in quickly, strong people, well, they just keep on... Going. There is that sort of assumption, isn't there? But it is is changing. Jessica, one hopes. One hopes. Um, I think people are increasingly aware that that's not a very useful or helpful message, or even a very true message, to be sending young people today. Um, although I think that the implicit message often remains of, um, particularly in the U.S., which is where I can speak from the most. Um, sort of this emphasis on self-dependence and high valuing of resiliency and being able to bounce back, um, that still exists. Mm -hmm. And young people notice that. <laughs> so I, I think the explicit and implicit messaging might not be perfectly in line yet, but it's moving in a right direction. Do you think young people are being let down, not just by um, perhaps their own emotions and, and the inability of family groups and the school professionals perhaps notice this thing, but also by um, governments in different countries, because it, it's, it's a fact, isn't it, that I think it's only a quarter in the UK of um, people who died by suicide over mm. a 10-year period had been in touch with mental health mm. services. It was ignored for far mm. too long. I'll, I'll come to Julie on that yeah. one, because you know the UK situation, obviously, yeah. better than Jessica does, but I'll, I'll ask you, Jessica, in a moment, if that was reflected where you are. It's, it's a disaster. 
to be honest. I mean, even though... Only a quarter of those who mm, took their own lives yeah. went to seek professional help. I'm not surprised. I mean, that's a, a, a thing that I see a lot in my private practice. Um, and again, for children and adolescent mental health services, even though the government has said we're putting X number of millions into those services, they're not getting to where they need to be got to. So actually, on the ground, frontline workers like myself, we don't see the money coming through to us and the waiting lists are just skyrocketing and they continue to skyrocket. Mm. The money is just, it's there, but we're not getting it and I'm not sure why. Um, and if we don't start with helping children at a grassroots level, then you end up with adults who have even more severe mental health problems and putting even more of a strain on the NHS services. So it doesn't yeah. matter how much money you put in. Jessica, same where you are. Although I would note, and you might be uh, interested in this, that more than three quarters of suicides around the world are not in countries mm. such as Great Britain or the United States. Mm. They're in low and middle income countries. Yeah. But, but the picture where you are, is, is, do you recognise what Julie's been saying? 100%. So why isn't it changing? What... Oh, that I could talk about for a while, but I'll try to be brief. Um, so, yes, the number and percentage of kids who are experiencing mental health problems is rising, but the level of accessing care um, is either stagnant or declining. Mm -hmm. And I think a big reason for that is the way the treatments are designed. They're designed to be delivered by highly trained professionals in often inaccessible clinical settings that many parents and families don't even live here. When they do access care, they're faced with a wait list of upwards of six months often. So the way uh, treatments are currently structured doesn't fit where kids are and the fact that when mental health needs emerge, they are uh, in, in need of being addressed as soon as possible. So, so in a sense, in a sense what we're hearing from somebody like Georgia and somebody like Aaron is to detect the problem early enough before it gets to the stage mm -hmm. where you would need the expert uh, advice of either Julie or Jessica, which may be very exactly. difficult to get. I think it's just empowering children to know what their voice that has value, and this is something that we're really kind of passionate about, is making children feel heard and always kind of having that at the focus of, of how they support one another as well as kind of um, feeding back into the, the loop of how we develop what we do in the future with children and how we support them. Wow, what are you trying Can to... Can I jump in quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so I think it's absolutely critical to help kids find their voice and find the confidence to seek help. But the bottom line is, if treatments aren't accessible, even when they do ask for help, it may not always be there. Yeah. What we do in our lab, um, the Lab for Scalable Mental Health at Stony Brook, is we try to redesign treatments to be briefer and to be more accessible, to be delivered in um, a variety of settings by non-professionals, um, online even. Um, so that kids, when they need that help, have a better chance of actually getting it. Okay, okay, take us through this in a little bit more detail, Jessica, if you would, because I was, you know, really the, the question at the end of this is how, how, how can we change it? And so what sort of different treatments are you looking at? Yeah, so we study what we, we call single session interventions. And this is something that as a trained clinician, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, I was quite skeptical of at first. Um, but we did quite a bit of research and looked at the body of evidence and found that across more than 50 randomized trials, even one session of therapy, if it's well targeted, can actually make a noticeable significant difference in the child's symptoms or in adolescent's symptoms. So we try to figure out what those kinds of one session treatments can target if, for, as is the case for the many kids who aren't getting any care at all, one session might be the best that's possible to give them right now. Um, we want to make sure that we're using that one session uh, to the yeah, fullest and yeah. targeting something that matters. And Julie, is this something that's um, being accepted ac across your discipline? That perhaps mm. it's not so much that um, the approaches mm. to people have failed, it's the treatments themselves that mm. have failed and therefore there needs to be a reappraisal of what does and doesn't work. Single session treatments are very, very rare. In fact, across the UK, they don't exist. In unless terms you pay for them privately. Unless you pay for them privately. Mm. And also, you know, if you look at the children, adolescent mental health services, their waiting lists, where I used to work in CAMS, were at least 12 months or longer, and that was just to get an assessment. 
So you can imagine how long the waiting list is just to get into treatment, even if you have one session. So what exciting new therapies, ideas have, have you got and have you discussed with you know, your, your other colleagues? Um, well, there is something that I use <coughs> quite a lot with the children that I work with as well, because I always think group therapy can be quite helpful. Um, and something I use quite regularly is working with horses, so equine therapy, and that way we can get big groups of children in to sort of relatively brief interventions. They're getting something. And we work... Explain to me how this works. So um, the horses work... We work with the sort of... Horses give us feedback and they give the children feedback. And because so you put them all together? Put them all together. Yeah. And it's a really lovely way of working because the horses react to the kids, the kids react to the horses, they have great fun. They have up to six or eight sessions if we can run them for them. And I saw something like this in the States many years ago yeah. uh, with dolphins. Yes. Severely autistic children were given the reward of being in the water with dolphins that had come in from the outside voluntarily. Yes. Um, and therefore their attention spans increased and, yeah. and, and their, their endorphins increased as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it's good to hear, isn't it, for you two yeah. as well, that there are people out there thinking of different ways of doing this. Because I, as um, Mabba haven't explained yet, is that there's so many people in the world and everybody's sort of different, but we all have one common ground when it comes to mental yeah. health. We all want to try and save ourselves. We all want to live better lives. We want to just be able to express ourselves and be free almost. And so if there are sort of services and therapies that are helping each individual person for what they're going through, then we're all up for it. Yeah, but the problem is the funding, isn't it? Because you're not going to find too many clinical psychologists who can, you know, whip up sort of five or six horses for five or six people <laughs> or dolphins or, or whatever. So do, do you despair? Well, what I do is personally is, because um, I work with young kids and adults as well, is I get them to, because I can't afford the budget or funding, et cetera, is I work with them one-to-one -one in a sort of creative way. So yeah. sort of help them express themselves via writing, filmmaking, maybe drawing. Even if they're not creative, we will sort of, I work with them to try and find a way to get them to express themselves. And I found that, that that sort of human interaction, just listening to them, being with them, does count a lot for, a lot, a lot for them. Because they have somebody that they can sort of go to, that can listen to do, have a shoulder, have a set of ears. Is your programme of the Franklin Scholars expanding in, in not just where you are, but sort of as, an, as a concept? Um, it's like, yes. it's, it's, it's peer advice, isn't it? it? It's peer support, it's structured yeah. um, and it's kind of it's mentoring along with some kind of academic uh, activities as well. Um, I'd like to think it was kind of a, a growing model and that people just using that widespread and like it's our dream that kind of it goes everywhere in the country, everywhere in the world, you never know. Um, I would say unfortunately that the pushback when you're talking about funding in particular numbers count and it's quite difficult to quantify the kind of things that we would like to see improvements with these children, their social and emotional well-being um, and kind of you know their feeling of self-worth um, it's quite a difficult thing to measure as a baseline and then also yeah. progress. It's something that is experienced and so the idea of a relationship as the mechanism in the middle is what we really value and we kind of want to make sure that those children feel that there's a relationship with a dependable older person, adult, caregiver, parent that they feel is listening to them in their life because it can be so important for them. Quick in thought here before we go because we're, we're running out of time unfortunately. Um, if a parent goes with their child to see a doctor and the doctor says not pull yourself together, but here's, here's a mother's little helper, have an mm. antidepressant. What should they say? I would... Um, On your, OK, you can talk from a personal point. From a personal perspective. Yeah, then I'll come if to that. If that to me, I would say, no, Mum, I just want you to listen. I just want you to be there for me. I don't want no medicine. I don't want all everything offered to me. I want you just to listen to me, just to be there physically, emotionally. Julie? It's, it's too, Here's the pill, you're going to get better. It's too cheap to give children medication, give them the therapy that they need, like Aaron was saying, let them hear, have their voices heard. Because a pill, what's a pill going to do? It's just going to lift their mood, but it's not going to enable them to be heard and be listened to and have... Uh, hang the, on, if, if your mood is lifted, if then your you mood feel is lifted, more like you're... De I mean, able I think to express yourself and you might be heard more, no? Therapy and medication can help, but I always say, why are we putting pills and drugs into our children? They're just children. They still need to develop emotionally, socially, physically, and always. I would say in very, very, very extreme cases, maybe think about medication. And I know that the Americans are very different, but... Well, let's ask, let's ask an American yeah. behind you. Jessica. I'm not all that different. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I would say is that 
a lot of the reasons that depression is so sticky is because adolescents and kids don't always have the skills to regulate those really difficult emotions when they come up and to change their thinking patterns. So a pill just teach them how to do that. Um, what therapy and especially something like cognitive behavioral therapy can do is offer a new toolkit um, to deal with those problems when they come up and to cope more effectively. And a pill alone may be a useful adjunct, but alone it's not going to do that work. Listen, I appreciate it. Thank you ever so much for, for getting up very early um, on Long Island, although I'm sure the weather out there is lovely and it'll be a beautiful long day for you now. <laughs> Jessica, thank you. Julie, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Georgia and Aaron, for coming on the programme. It's gone far too quickly, as I think it often does, but I do hope if you've been watching out there, um, you may have got some pointers, if you feel you, you need them, about how in this stressful modern age you can come to terms with, with depression, if you are particularly, if you are a young person. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for watching. I'm David Foster. We hope to have your company next time. Goodbye for now.